so very good uh, a very good morning uh, my topic for this session is a uh, lower eyelid sclerosis the effects on the functional ep4r i uh, can i switch okay thank you so i know financial disclosures uh, as we all know the lower lid has a major role in the maintaining the uh, blink mechanism and the lacrimal pump mechanism so any surgery which is involving the lower lid either it could be a blepharoplasty lower lid blepharoplasty we need to maintain the tightening and the laxity of the lid in a very adequate way to get the good functional outcomes so lower eyelid blepharoplasty it is being a time test uh, time tested technique uh, which uh, usually considered as an aesthetic surgery uh, it causes a positive changes in the restoration of the Thanks. aging periorbital tissue concerning the brow and the cheek for a youthful facial look so while fat and skin excision are still carried out with the current lower lid blepharoplasty present trend follows a tissue preserving philosophy that may include the orbital and the soup location and the fat transposition to restore the apparent volume loss associated with the facial aging so lower eyelid blepharoplasty we have the documentation where stamping procedures when combined like in the form of a septorapy or tightening of the orbital we don't have any problem in giving the block tendon and skin yields the favorable functional outcomes So now, uh, when we talk about the SMS, that is the superficial muscular aponeurotic system, which is often described as an organized fibrous network, which act, act as an aponeurotic mask and invest the facial muscle and connect with the dermis. It is uniquely positioned to reflect and respond to the global eye movements. So the concept of SMS is generally accepted in the aesthetic surgeries and is applied to correct the ptosis of the facial fat in areas prone to aging, whereby the SMS is drawn up and fixed to the more superficial muscular and the dermal structures. So the uh, functionally before a uh, kind of a subjective symptom of overflow tears is a major determinant of quality of life. So by keeping all these points into the consideration, we have considered that when we perform a lower lid blepharoplasty with the SMAS and the orbicularis oculi lift, it can alter the horizontal lid vectors uh, with an improved eyelid contour and eyelid tension. Definitely decreases the excessive skin fold and has the lid laxity and it causes strengthening of the lateral canthal tendon. So it can result in a refined blink mechanism. So with all this, we have. formulated in study where we try to assess the effect of the lower lid blepharoplasty with an smas and the orbicularis oculi lift on the improvement in functional ep4 and the quality of life parameters so this study was conducted over a period of one year it was a prospective international study where 18 patients approved by the research and ethical committee were underwent the lower lid blepharoplasty in smas and orbicularis oculi lift so it uh, pre operative and post operative assessment was performed at one month and six months for the ep4r grading we have considered the monk score the traditional one and the for quality of life questionnaire we have considered the uh, validated lacrimal symptom questionnaire so the authors pre uh, preferred surgical technique was a transconjunctival approach however we also given a transcutaneous incision for the smas orbicularis oculi lift so medial central lateral fat pads are fashioned into the three fat pedicles which are repositioned or relocated beyond the Intra orbital rim into the soft area. In order to strengthen the lax orbicularis oculi, the SMS orbicularis complex is identified, and a flap is fashioned, which is then lifted and fixed to the inferomedial super superficial temporoparietal fascia. So the results were uh, uh, obtained after a six months follow-up visit, where a majority of the patients, in terms of the anatomical results, have achieved the symmetrical and the adequate lid contour. A high lid slant was observed, however, in the two of the eyelids. in terms of the functional results we have observed a significant decrease in the monk score in comparison to baseline both at 1 month and 6 month respectively and a significant improvement in the quality of life parameters at 6 months follow up visit so coming on to the discussion previously the upper lid blepharoplasty have been evaluated and documented resulted in comparison to the functional ep4 however the literature is still lacking and no study have yet performed which have considered and compared the lower lid blepharoplasty in relation to the functional ep4 so uh, basically this is a surgical technique so i would like to highlight few of the surgical points which we need to take care to get the foot, uh, good functional outcomes so why we have given with the both uh, two incision that is a transcutaneous and transconjunctival transconjunctival definitely because it provides a better access and repositioning of the fat pads plication of the soup and suspension of the mid facial tissue are effective in mid facial rejuvenation and same aspect we utilize in our current technique Uh, however the soup is being an illusive entity and can only be visualized from the suborbicularis space during a skin muscle flap procedure and that's why we given a skin incision the second point is that we need to take care of the critical zone which contains the terminal twigs of the zygomatic branches of the facial nerve that supply the pre dorsal and the pre subtal orbicularis oculi muscle 
if we are going to damage this then this may result in the iatrogenic ectropy on the weakness of the lower eyelid following the transconjunctival lower ectroplasty when we combined with this mass the next point is the clifford ligament as you all know it's an arcuate expansion of the lockwood ligament and it inserts into the inferolateral orbital ring so this ligament has a major role in maintaining the lateral support and that's why uh, uh, we need uh, it served to check the infractus and inferoglic muscle and acts as a protective uh, mechanism to prevent the excessive backward displacement of the Lockwood ligament. The fourth point we have kept into consideration that is the inferior oblique. The inferior oblique usually remains spared very well in the transconjunctile approach. However, when we perform SMS orbicularis lift, then aggressive transposition with simultaneous stretch can cause IOM and cause has uh, result in diplopia. So, uh, being the small sample size and heterogeneity in terms of oxygen repositioning of fat set, uh, these were the limitations of the study. And uh, here I would like to conclude the lower light uh, blepharoplasty led to alteration in the orbitomolar vectors along with improved eyelid contour and eyelid tension, reduction of the excessive skin fold with lid laxity and strengthening of the lateral canthal ligament, hence, result in a refined lacrimal pump mechanism. It acts as a promising technique to reduce the bothersome functional EP4 and improve quality of fat. Thank you. Yes, sir. So basically, we have uh, any case even with a medial ectropion was rolled out. We have just considered all the cases where we just got a skin laxity in the form of either a medial canthal laxity or a horizontal can canthal laxity, but without any component of ectropion. If the puncta was opposed, then uh, this uh, that is the start uh, initiation of the sir ectropion. Uh, sir, we have performed the basic test for the ectropion. We have done all the laxity test. We have performed the lateral medial canthal. We have done the pinch test also, sir. But uh, uh, I don't think in any of the cases there was a component of ectropion. We have considered a patient for the study. Uh, except this, we have not performed any test, sir. Yes, sir. Right, sir. Right. Right, sir. Right, sir. Sir, right now, we are just went ahead with the uh, uh, observation at one month and six months. In future, we can consider this component because definitely the Botox is one of the main uh, utility which we use in advance. Right, sir. But in Botox, sir, definitely the patient will require the frequent three to three to six months again and again, and the, the cost effective is a. Okay, sir. Right, sir. So, nice presentation, Dr. Vipar. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very like much. Call upon the next speaker, Dr. Shafina, please. And she will please. Okay, Shafina, are you aware that you are not a ratified member? So I'm not aware. Not okay. We will not be judging you for the best of okay. paper, but you can present. Good morning, all. Uh, I'd like to speak about Icebreaker, which is an innovation for orbit and oculoplasty surgery. Uh, in surgical practice, it is essential to provide a clear and bloodless working field. Hence, a section apparatus is are required. It's an important part of surgery. Ophthalmology as a surgical branch involves small quantity of blood loss. Like in cataract surgery, it will be less than 5 ml, and orbital surgery around 75 ml. However, small area of surgery and delicate tissue is uh, a unique challenge in aspiration of blood. Also, there is pooling of uh, blood and fluid in deep socket and the bleeding is an important uh, it's an, uh, challenge in surgery, especially in orbital surgery, which require deep tissue access. Over years, there are many types of aspirations, uh, aspiration equipments like angiosterometer, manually operated suction pump, electrical suction pump. But the pressure in these instruments are very high and also the suction tips are very large which is difficult to maneuver in the small orbital field. Aspirator, our innovation uh, is made to solve the problems created by uh, aspiration equipments. It is an easy do-it-yourself and cost-effective and efficient tool to aspirate small amount of blood in surgical field. It can be made uh, using uh, 
recyclable and easily available components. It consists of a food pedal, a DC adapter, a DC water pump, an intravenous set, and collect collection bottle and a bottle stand. And it works uh, by direct current, which is connected by an uh, adapter. And this adapter is connected to a foot pedal, which acts as an on and off uh, switch. And this foot pedal is connected to a uh, self-priming motor. And to the aspiration end, it is connected to a tube, which is connected to an opening in the collection bottle, and which will create a vacuum inside the uh, collection bottle. And there is another opening on the bottle, which is connected to the IV set. And this IV set is connected to the, it can be, uh, the other end of the IV set can be used in the uh, surgical field for aspiration. So when the foot pedal is on, it will uh, on the motor, which will create vacuum inside the tube, uh, inside the collection bottle, which will aspirate the fluid inside. Uh, there's a video, I will play the video in the last. So the advantages are, uh, this aspiration is controlled effectively by foot pedal, uh, as and when required, unless the conventional aspiration tube, which is always uh, in on. And uh, the opening of the drip set is small and flexible, which can be easily maneuvered in small surgical field. And new IV set can be used for each surgery, which will, uh, which will uh, avoid the need for uh, um, sterilization of the whole equipments for each uh, patient and it will uh, avoid gross infection and the entire apparatus can be sterilized by ethylene dioxide uh, sterilization and it is cost effective because uh, the entire equipment will cost uh, less than 1500 rupees and can be uh, used for orbital surgeries like dactyocystorhinostomy, dactyocystectomy, excision biopsy, orbitotomies and uh, eviscerations. These are my references. I'll play the video of working of the instrument. So this is the adapter which is connected to the power source and which is connected to a foot pedal and this is the motor which is connected to the collection tube and this collection tube is a used uh, saline bottle and from here uh, the IV set is connected which is go going to the surgical space and we saw that uh, it is uh, clearly aspirating all the blood and giving a clear surgical field which makes the surgery more uh, easy and reduce the time of surgery. The blood is aspirated when when the foot pedal is on. Thanks. Yeah. Actually, I'm doing a study comparing the comparing it with the normal. Uh, it will take less than uh, it will be less than thousand five hundred the whole equipment. Oh, yeah. yeah, definitely. Thank you. Take her later whenever she arrives. We can take her. We'll move ahead to the next speaker. So she'll be speaking about the sensational tutorial. 
Good morning one and all. Today I'll be discussing about a case series of patients who underwent corneal neurotization. Corneal neurotization as we know, it involves the transfer of a healthy donor nerve segment into a tissue to re-establish either motor or sensory innervation. It describes the restoration of structural nerve growth into the cornea to restore corneal sensation and tropic function. The main aim of our study is to report our practices and outcomes in treatment of neurotropic keratitis through corneal neurotization using tissue nerve grafts. It is a retrospective type of a case series involved in oculoplasty and corneal surgeon over nine eyes of eight patients over a period of 18 to 24 months. Moving on to the surgical technique which was done under general anesthesia. First, the shural nerve was harvested about 10 to 15 centimeters of it from the mid-calf region. And here you can see from uh, the right hand side, first the subpro incision was taken on the contralateral side and the supra or vital supra ophthalmic uh, nerve is uh, identified and it is stacked. And then uh, on the opposite side, sural nerve, the distal end of the sural nerve is divided into five fascicles and then scleral or corneoscleral tunnels are made with the help of a crescent and the five fascicles are inserted and sutured, secured to it around the limbus circumferentially in a neat manner and secured with 10 nylon and the conjunctiva is secured with uh, interrupted, uh, sorry, continuous interlocking sutures. Then the proximal end of the sural nerve is taken out through the upper fornix and it is crossed over the nasal bridge and brought out through the contralateral subpro incision that was taken and it is coapted, side to end coaptation is done with the supraorbital nerve and then it is the closed in layers. These are our results. The patients not only just went corneal neurotization but also underwent uh, corneal surgeries like DALC and uh, PKP along with some oclo other oclopticity surgeries like uh, tarsorephy, dermoid excision etc. So I'd like to particularly talk about patient number 3. This patient had left eye congenital anesthesia, corneal anesthesia and underwent a contralateral corneal neurotization along with DALC procedure. Five fascicle surgery was done and it was sutured to scleral tunnels. Uh, in the post-operative period, about 24 months, we saw that the corneal sensations were present, the corneal sheen surface improved and even the corneal reflex was present. Here I'd like to talk about patient number 6. This patient had both eye congenital anesthesia syndrome and both eyes underwent PKP along with ipsilateral corneal uh, neurotization. Sadly, right eye we lost to traumatic endophthalmitis. Left eye was followed up for 24 months and this was a three fascicle surgery, suture to scleral tunnels. The corneal sensations were present, the overall ocular surface health as well improved. We did note that the patients with five fascicles uh, had a faster and a better response compared to three and four fascicles. And amongst the two patients who had five fascicle surgeries, the second patient in particular by 12 to 14 months showed uh, a much better response. And um, even the first patient who had fourth month response was better when it was secured to the corneoscleral tunnel. Overall, the patients did improve by 12 months. The two patients, the two eyes that were followed up beyond 12 months showed a much better response with time. Patients with corneoscleral tun tunnel showed a faster response. Younger age groups showed a faster response. And there was no difference uh, in the results between contralateral versus ipsilateral sural nerve transplant. This is the confocal microscopy of a patient preoperatively and postoperatively. You can see that there is evident corneal nerve budding by 12 to 24 months. This is a patient who underwent corneal neurotization along with a DALC procedure. Post-op day 1 and post-op day 14, if you compare it with post-op 8 months, you can see the corneal reflex surface and sheen has definitely improved. Uh, this is one of the first patients again who had undergone DALC and corneal uh, neurotization and it was published. Uh, the ASOCT shows the presence of the fascicle, the nerve fascicle bundle in the uh, scleral, uh, in, in, the, in the sclera and it is well in place. 
preoperatively this patient underwent left eye corneal neurotization you can see there is no corneal sensations and now the left eye sensations are going to be checked the patient blinks and that is the success of the surgery so to conclude i hereby say that corneal neurotization is a very promising procedure with satisfactory outcomes corneal transplant and other lit procedures can be combined along with neurotization and along with the reappearance of corneal sensations the overall improvement of ocular surface can also be considered as a successful outcome the only limitation we had was unavailability of a corneal anesthesiometer thank you one and all First, the corneal surgery was done, sir, and then the neurotization was done. So, few patients, it was done in a period of a month's time, and few patients, if there was no improvement, it was checked again, and then neurotization was planned. Yes, sir. Was there any case in which just neurotization was done? Yes, sir. There were patients. There and were patients, did, uh, and uh, they are improving, they sir. Were improving. They were improving. And where did you uh, suture the proximal end of the sural nerve? The proximal end of the sural nerve, either ipsilateral and few cases on the contralateral. So that's uh, the well, ipsilateral versus contralateral. There was not much difference that we observed. Not much. Uh, not much and difference. Why did you choose GA for this surgery? Any so specific reason? A long procedure. Then sural nerve was uh, gra uh, grafted, and you most of the patients were young. So the oclo are oc my oculoplasty surgery. No. Nylon, so ten zero nylon. Side to end coaptation was done, sir, directly. No, sir, directly it was. Okay, so uh, nice presentation. Thank nice you, sir. Thank you. This next speaker, Dr. Swati Goel, here. Dr. Swati Goel. If Dr. Swati is not, I'll be speaking about posterior medial canthal anchorage, a simple technique. Very good morning to all present here. I am presenting on a simplified technique by name posterior medial canthal anchorage. Okay. Conditions which cause medial canthal deformities are age-related medial canthal tendon laxity, long-standing facial palsy, traumatic avulsion of the lips, secretorial medial ectropion. Medial canthal deformity hampers the normal eyelid function with respect to tear drainage and ocular surface integrity, which causes eyelid malpositions like ectropion and entropion, which in turn causes ocular discomfortness, foreign body sensation, watering, punctate epithelial erosions, and blurred vision. Anatomically, medial canthus is very complex considering its close proximity to the lacrimal drainage system. Correcting its disruption is challenging. Here we describe a new technique, transcurrencular medial canthal tendon anchorage, either with or without thermal medial thermoplasty. To the best of our knowledge, this technique of modified medial thermoplasty in combination with posterior medial canthal anchorage has not been described in literature so far. Our purpose of the study was to describe 
a simple quick reproducible and minimally invasive technique for mct dehiscence and deformity and this is a retrospective case series study performed over a period of one year from Jan 21 to Jan 22. And the patients included are seven patients of facial nerve palsy with a significant lag of thalmus, one patient of old traumatic secretarial medial ectropion, one senile horizontal lid laxity patient, one lower lid avulsion with canalicular laceration. All the patients underwent routine slit lamp examination, lectromal patency being checked, all the preoperative data collected from the records regarding punctal position, the degree of medial canthal tendon laxity assessed by the lateral distraction test given by Olver system, lid contour abnormality graded using Gower braiding system, any history of trauma was also noted. Post-operative outcome parameters are resolution of symptoms, restoration of normal eyelid contour, punctal position, medial canthal tendon laxity improvement. And all surgeries performed under local anesthesia in order to prevent the surgically induced canalicular injury, lacrimal probe has been inserted. Primarily, a current colectomy is done. And then, at, uh, as seen in the video, triangular area medial to the punctum uh, is uh, deeply cauterized using the radio frequency cautery, followed by a double armed 6O Y grill passed in a horizontal mattress fashion from the medial end of the tarsal plane, including the diathermized area in a posterior superior direction towards the posterior lacrimal crest and uh, exteriorized on the skin as high as possible. Uh, in a, uh, wherever necessary in some patients with a long-standing facial palsy, additional standard surgical techniques is also performed like upper lid blepharotomy, mullerectomy, lateral tarsal slip, lower lid spacer and so forth. All patients were followed up for a period of six months where uh, 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 nine out of 10 patients showed asymptomatic improvement with no epiphora, ocular discomfort dramatically improved in nine patients. One patient had some discomfortness. Lid contour was satisfactory in all patients. All had adequate lid tightening with lid globe opposition. Puncta was a well opposed in nine patients. Residual punctal aversion noted in one long-standing facial palsy patient. None of the facial nerve palsy patient had a residual lid laxity. Lag of thalmus was reduced in all facial palsy patients. Here is a patient uh, with a left-sided uh, facial palsy who underwent uh, posterior medial thermoplasty with posterior medial canthal anchorage suture, showed a well-corrected lid contour with a punctum globe opposition. And here one more patient with a right-sided uh, long-standing facial palsy who already underwent direct bro lift with uh, medial tarsorophy somewhere else presented to our institute with a wide lag of thalmus and high symptoms, who underwent uh, right eye upper lid uh, blepharotomy, lower lid spacer, so lift along with uh, thermoplasty and posterior medial canthal anchorage showing a corrected lag of thalmus and also good contour with mild punctal aversion. And here is a patient with uh, old traumatic medial canthus malalignment post surgery uh, two weeks showing a good lid contour and punctal opposition. And uh, uh, usually in a canalicular laceration repair with intubation often leaves a notch at the site of tear because of the lateral pull of the eyelid which can be prevented with a counter traction PMCA suture like this patient. And similar kind of suture is required in eyelid avulsion where inferior to superior traction is required which may not be possible with a simple monocanalicular intubation which can be achieved with PMCA suture. Based on this reference which describes the posterior medial canthal thermoplasty technique, we modified the uh, technique uh, and the modification as primarily current colectomy is done, then a diathermy burn applied, absorbable suture in a posterior superior direction from medial end of tarsal plate. Uh, uh, in the direction of posterior lacrimal crest. All patients had more than satisfactory outcomes with respect to lid contour, medial canthal integrity, punctal opposition, and symptomatic relief. Here I conclude, uh, posterior medial canthal anchorage is a new, simple, safe, minimally invasive, and effective procedure that addresses the MCT dehiscence and deformity in comparison to open conventional technique. And it reduces the amount of high lid resection, reduces MCT laxity with no external scar, and maintains canalicular patency with some amount of compromised hornless muscle function. Thank you.
Use the mic. So by doing currenchlectomy, we are uh, um, creating a raw surface which helps in the addition, sir. And also the suture track fibrosis holds the lid against the uh, gravity. With that concept, we used uh, six of our threads. Yes, sir. Sure. Yes. It's a good point. Actually, she is relying on fibrosis to set in and do the job. We can always try. Yes. Yes. Sure. Sure, sir. Especially yes. with the effect gravity plays, it can always come back. Okay. So How long is your follow-up? Sir, uh, uh, up to six months we have followed up, sir. The visit was uh, two weeks, one month, six months. No recurrence? No, uh, till now no recurrence, sir. Yes, ma'am. Ma yes, ma'am. Ma'am, one is non-incisional. Uh, here, we are not taking any incision uh, on the medial canthal area. Second thing, uh, by creating the raw surface itself, and we are hankering against the uh, gravity. Uh, yes, ma'am. Some amount of the canalicular kinking, conjunctiva is getting contract. Yes, ma'am. Ma 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 canalicular kinking is a high rate when it compares to uh, plication in comparison to um, anchorage. Longer follow up, yes. Yes, ma'am. Speaker Dr. Amrita Valli, then we move on to our next speaker, Dr. Prabisham Benaji. Dr. Prabisha will be speaking about autologous bed grafting, our experience at our tertiary eye care center. Good afternoon everyone, I will be sharing our experience on autologous fat grafting. So autologous fat graft was introduced by Newbear. He used an open technique for fat transferring. Now with the advancement in the technology, it has found wide application in aesthetic surgery like facial recontouring, scar management etc. So ours is the first study from India to report its use in sockets. This is a retrospective interventional study which was uh, uh, done between January 2019 and March 21. So we have used autologous fat graft in various, uh, in various types of patient and these are the parameters we assist for each patient respectively. Uh, coming to the surgical technique, all the cases were done under general anesthesia. Uh, the donor site we selected to be the lower abdomen. The, a small stab incision was made and the tumescent solution which is composed of 100 ml of normal saline, 30 ml of 2% lignocin and 1 ml of adrenaline was introduced in a fanning method. After 5 to 10 minutes, a 3 uh, mm Coleman cannula fitted with a 10 ml syringe and lure lock was introduced and fat was harvested using a negative pressure technique. So then it was left alone to settle down using the gravitational force. After it has settled down, the plasma, the serum was separated from the fat and the remaining fat was transferred in a 3 ml of syringe and then using a 20 gauge cannula it was injected in the recipient site. So the remaining fat, it was stored at minus 20 degree for four weeks. And after four weeks, if any patient required repeat injection, it was given. We have followed up the patient at the first week, fourth week and six months. 
so we have included 17 patients the mean age was 30 years and we found that orbital volume augmentation was the most common indication for AFG in our cohort the trauma was the most common etiological agent and in the orbital cases of volume augmentation the anophthalmic socket was the major number of cases followed by residual enophthalmus after orbital uh, fracture correction we have used approximately around 5 ml of fats for uh, these cases especially the socket and the residual enophthalmus and uh, we noted that further augmentation was required for three patients one with the residual in, uh, two with the residual enophthalmus and one with superior sulcus deformity we have followed up the patient for a mean of six months and resorption of this autologous fat graft was noted in three patients now out of this three patients one required repeat afg harvestation one patient had uh, already contracted socket and had already undergone multiple procedure so we repeated a dummy's fat graft for that patient and the temporal hollowness patient was a rb patient post radiotherapy so we assume that could be the cause of this atrophy now this is one young lady who had undergone fracture repair elsewhere and presented to us with superior sulcus deformity and this is the outcome at the final checkup after autologous fat graft injection similarly this is a middle aged man who had uh, who had undergone trauma and he developed a tear graft deformity and this is the outcome after autologous fat graft injection now this is the outcome we uh, we achieved in our socket cases now this sydney uh, cole man he introduced the latest technique of autologous fat graft transfer and the usual ab uh, donor site is abdomen so it has been noted that harvest station with 3 mm of Coleman cannula give optimum results however uh, smaller cannula is used for better results and we noted that structural integrity is better with the sedimentation method slow injection assures better fat imbibation and with volume augmentation in sockets we can avoid uh, surgical intervention like DFG so optimum outcome is achieved Fat cells also possesses mesenchymal stem cells, which gives a better skin remodeling also in this patient. However, much said, AFG survival is unpredictable. So blindness is the most severe complication that can occur. It occurs due to intraarterial injection of autologous fat. These are the limitations of our study. Uh, we could have taken a control arm with centrifugation, but we couldn't achieve that. So to conclude, it is a minimally invasive technique and it can, uh, it can be used in the correction of residual enophthalmus. It gives optimum outcome. Cryopreserved fat, although it has been noted that there is depletion of stem cells in them, but we have found optimum results. However, further studies are recommended to see the fat survival and all. Thank you. These are my references. Patients are doing good. At one year also, you have found them to be doing good. But yes, three patients, as I already told you, sir, three patients required uh, repeat injection at four weeks. And at after six months, we noted atrophy in those three patients in our this study.
Are there any other questions for this? Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Bishan. A very good, good morning, everybody. I'm here to present my uh, clinical study on management of patients with orbital sarcoidosis. So as we know, uh, uh, sarcoidosis is a multi-system disorder. Most commonly, it generally affects the lungs. Ocular involvement as such is generally very rare. And if we do see any cases, it's always in the form of a uveitis. So I'm, uh, I did a literature search. And the number of case, large case series are very few. And especially, there are hardly any uh, other than few small case reports from India. So my study was on the clinical features and management outcomes of orbital and adenexal sarcoidosis. It was a retrospective study. We studied uh, all patients who present with sarcoidosis for the last 10 years at two tertiary IKI centers. We collected the demographic details, the clinical features, what is the treatment given to each patient, and the management outcomes. So only patients who presented on histopathology with non-caseating epithelial granulomas were included, and we made sure that we ruled out all other causes for epithelial granulomas. Uh, when uh, all patients underwent imaging, either in the form of an MRI or CT, HRCT chests were done for all patients once histopathology confirmed sarcoid and AC serum AC levels were done. So our study included 21 patients with a mean age of 47.7 years. We saw that we had a female preponderance as all, all seen in literature. Uh, right and left eye were equally involved but five patients had a bilateral involvement. The mean duration of symptom onset was 2.45 months and we noticed that the most common presenting feature was an upper eyelid swelling followed by lacrimal gland enlargement, a palpable mass, proptosis. Uh, we had one each of a sac swelling and a conjunctival nodule. Uh, one patient had a bilateral lacrimal gland involvement. None of our patients had intraocular so anterior segments were normal and there was no past history of tuberculosis. Imaging was done in all except two, the reason being one presented like an acute dacrocystitis and the other had a conjunctival nodule, hence imaging was deferred in these two patients. Uh, we found lacrimal gland to be involved in four, whereas eight patients had a diffuse or uh, had an orbital soft tissue mass of which three had a diffuse lesion, the remaining had well-defined lesions. Extraocular muscle and conjunctiva you can see was just one one each. So based on the clinical features and imaging findings, the most uh, common initial diagnosis was either an IOID or a lymphoproliferative disorder. Since these patients had already undergone treatment elsewhere, hadn't responded to treatment, or there was some kind of a clinical radiological uh, mismatch, we went ahead with uh, surgery, uh, of which incision biopsy was done in 16 patients and an excision biopsy was done in 5 patients. All patients had characteristic non-epithelial, non-caseating granulomas confirming diagnosis of an orbital sarcoidosis. Uh, HRCT chest was done in 19, of which we found that bilateral lymphadenopathy hilar was seen in 11, whereas 8 patients did not have any pulmonary involvement, and none of our patients had a past history of sarcoidosis for which they were taking any treatment. Uh, serum angiotensin converting enzyme levels were raised in 10 patients, whereas lysozyme and calcium were normal in these uh, 11 patients. So, uh, in accordance with the pulmonologist, we treated these patients. Uh, oral steroids were given to seven patients. Five patients who did not respond with oral steroids were, uh, uh, started an additional oral methotrexate. The mean duration of treatment was around two to four, uh, four months for these patients. Observation was done in three because the mass was completely removed. Six of our patients were lost to follow up post surgery. So, mean duration of follow up was seven months. And in these seven months, we found the outcomes. Complete resolution was seen in 13 patients and a partial resolution was seen in two. And none of our patients had a, any recurrence. So these are some of our patients. You can see this is patient one who is presented with a bilateral lower lid swelling and MRI also shows an ill-defined mass and conjunctival nodules which was shown to be sarcoidosis. The second patient is similar with a lower lid uh, mass and there is a patient with a bilateral lacrimal gland involving both the palpable and the orbital lobe. Here is a patient with a conjunctival nodule uh, which, uh, and this is hilar lymphadenopathy. This patient was treated with steroids and you can see this complete uh, was only treated with topical steroids and a complete resolution. So sarcoidosis affects the lungs, eye is seen to be involved in 25 to 60 and most often they say that eye involvement occurs secondary to a systemic sarcoidosis. So when we see the ophthalmic manifestations, it can involve any part of the eye. Starting from the eyelids, it can involve the sclera uh, as well as the optic nerve in the form of neurosarcoidosis, orbit and even intracranial involvement can occur. 
This is a patient one of ours who had a pure extra ocular muscle involvement with tendon involvement. But clinically, when on when the patient present, it looked very much like a thyroid active of thyroid eye disease. And similar reports have been published in literature where sarcoidosis presents mimicking a thyroid eye disease. This is a patient who presented with an acute dacrocystitis, and we assumed it to be a uh, acute dac, but she did not respond to analgesics. And hence, we imaged and we found that she had a soft tissue mass in the medial canthal region, and she was diagnosed with sarcoid. Similar reports have also been published. It's important to keep this in mind because it's one of the important causes for a failed DCR, which is sometimes missed. So there's always a controversy in terms of diagnosis. Many authors believe that you can only diagnose an orbital sarcoidosis if a patient has a systemic sarcoidosis. But the, uh, but there are also uh, debates against it because there is published literature where not all cases of an orbital sarcoid on histopathology have a systemic involvement. This is a large case series of 30 patients uh, where they noticed that only 11 had orbital sarcoidosis past history, 8 were simultaneously diagnosed and 9 never developed sarcoidosis in follow-up. It's very important to do systemic workup for all patients to rule out a systemic involvement. So treatment for sarcoid is very straightforward. It's generally steroids as a first line management. Most patients re are resolved with oral steroids. In well well circumscribed lesions, an intralesional steroid can also be given and shows very good response. In those who don't respond to steroids or those who have intolerance to steroids, you can start them on steroid sparing agents and methotrexate works really well. If not for methotrexate, mycophenolate and cyclosporin. This is a literature review that we did. We found uh, most studies had lacrimal, but ours had soft tissue uh, involvement was more common. As to conclude, uh, it is a rare disorder, but you need to keep it in mind as a differential. And uh, so treatment in these patients generally has good outcomes, but it's important to have a long-term follow-up. Thank you. So we started based on the body weight, madam, one milligram per kg body weight. Uh, so based on that, we slow tapered it over two to three months. Over two, three months? Yes, ma'am. So you gave it uh, like on daily basis or was it? On normal? daily basis, oral steroids. No, I asked for methotrexate. Oh, methotrexate. Methotrexate was given once weekly and it was only given uh, for patients who are not responding to steroid. How much? So methotrexate, we started 500 milligram and once we 50 milligrams sorry and then we tapered it down no not by oculoplasty we sent to the palm no, yeah yeah we never give uh, uh, immunosuppressants at our place we always refer to palm knowledge and they start yes yeah they were monitored correct for it Yeah, but generally it's very rare. So in twenty, uh, uh, in te so such a long duration, we only had twenty. Uh, yes, most often they're misdiagnosed with tuberculosis. Yeah. Yes, correct. Yeah, most often we found everywhere lacrimal gland ours was more of a soft tissue involvement where most people diagnose it as an IOID so we need to keep this in mind yes sir yes sir all the cases yes sir yes sir so in the muscle biopsy we took the uh, um, from the inferior oblique so we expose the muscle and we take it from the or, uh, orbital part the muscle belly and we take it along the long axis of the muscle inferior oblique or long yes yes sir and in the other patient because we suspected that there was some uh, pathology for the lacrimal sac we opened up the entire sac so we just left a small frill of tissue and the rest of the entire sac granulation tissue was removed completely uh, DCT, but again, um, a modified DCR, the entire sac tissue was removed and then created an osteum. Yeah, more like a DCT. Yes, DCT, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So in India, as such, there are not any cases reports of that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll move on to the. No. 
good morning one and all uh, today i'm going to be speaking on my free paper on muscle biopsy to change we have nil financial disclosure the purpose of our study was to evaluate the role of muscle biopsy in the diagnosis and management of patients presenting with isolated extraocular muscle lesions so it was a retrospective analysis conducted on 23 eyes of 18 patients who underwent muscle biopsy in a period of 12 years we ruled out vascular and infectious etiologies and we studied the demographics radiological histopathological details surgical details and the clinical radiological outcomes of the patient we performed the standard technique of an open muscle biopsy where we uh, did a, a conjunctival peritomy incise the tenon's fascia to expose the muscle of interest and then the biopsy was taken from the orbital layer of the muscle ensuring to stay parallel to the long axis of the muscle and avoiding damage to the motor nerves we used a uh, tooth forceps gripping the specimen only once avoiding crush artifacts so the mean age of the patients in our study was around 42 years there was a slight male predilection and the most common chief complaint they presented was was proptosis uh we had around uh, 13 patients who presented with unilateral lesions and five patients presented with bilateral lesions the most common muscle that was involved on imaging in our study was a lateral rectus muscle and the indications for biopsy were those uh, patients who didn't improve with empirical treatment and lesions that were clinical radiologically inconclusive the most commonly biopsied muscles were the lateral rectus and the inferior recti muscle this is a tabular column showing the suspected diagnosis and the diagnosis after muscle biopsy so we had seven cases of ioid two cases of dermoids two uh, lymphoproliferative cases two granulomatous inflammations one leiomyoma and amyloid deposits so in nine patients the diagnosis changed after biopsy and in seven patients it was confirmed in two patients the biopsy was inconclusive so there was an overall clinical radiological improvement of 83.1% which was statistically significant i'd like to discuss a few case scenarios this is a patient who was a 60 year old male who presented with a painful diminution of vision sudden onset since one month and he was diagnosed elsewhere to have orbital cellulitis and he was treated with oral antibiotics but did not improve imaging showed a well defined enhancing lesion in the right lateral rectus and a ring enhancing lesion in the left inferior rectus biopsy and then immunohistochemistry proved this lesion to be a neuroendocrine tumor a pet done showed that it was from the distal jejunal loop this patient received systemic chemotherapy but succumbed to systemic disease in 2 years this is another case of a 47 year old male who presented with a progressive inward deviation of the right eye and diplopia he was treated elsewhere as an ioid and given oral steroids but did not respond Imaging showed a, we a well-defined mass in the right lateral rectus, and on table the mass seemed to be infiltrated with yellowish deposits. So this led us to suspect an aneuplasm or a metabolic disorder. Histopathology then confirmed it to be amyloid deposits. This is another case of a 20-year-old female who was a case of recurrent IOID, not responding to oral steroids. On imaging, we saw tendon involving mass. and we suspected either an ioid or neoplastic lesion or igg4 disease and histopathology proved it to be ioid she did well with a course of mycophenolate and interlesional steroids so muscle uh, extraocular muscle enlargement can be either inflammatory vascular metabolic or neoplastic in origin and depending on the muscle involved uh, we have different approaches among the different biopsy techniques that have been described the open technique is the one that's most commonly used and the one we used in our study So this is an algorithm that shows us on how to approach a patient who comes with uh, muscle enlargement. So uh, if the patient has imaging that's consistent with TED but the history and clinical findings are not or the imaging is atypical of TED but the patient doesn't show any response to a corticosteroid tri uh, trial or the screening for metastatic disease is negative in the case of a known ma uh, malignancy one can proceed with a muscle biopsy. So just like in other studies uh, in our study also the uh, IOID was the most common cause of EOM enlargement and there were few complications reported in other studies like diplopia adhesion ptosis and infections following biopsy in our study two patients were complicated by symblephron and rupture of dermoid uh, cyst while performing the biopsy 
so uh, we had a few masqueraders in our study like uh, there was a case of sarcoid granuloma which is thought to be a thyroid eye disease and a neuroendocrine tumor which i just described which presented as a hot orbit and similar uh, reports have been uh, described previously in literature we also had two cases of uh, lymphoproliferative lesions which were thought to be ted and myositis earlier a paper by bodo et al has also reported similar cases uh we uh, the limitations in our study was that a single surgeon did not perform all the cases and our sample size was too small to bring out the association between the patterns of the muscle involvement and the disease the use of steroids before the biopsy could have been a confounding factor and the retrospective nature of the study could have introduced an investigator bias however muscle biopsy does play a critical role in lesions that are clinico radiologically inconclusive and those that don't show response to treatment it is a simple easy to perform uh, method which has low morbidity and it significantly improves the treatment outcome thank you yes sir uh we didn't follow any fixed uh, duration before stopping but we stopped the steroids because that would alter the uh, histology two weeks to a month yeah it was was like Yes sir it was it was it was uh, suspected to be a dermoid but it was only involving the muscle so uh, this was a case which we almost thought it was a dermoid there was no real confusion as such that it could be anything else it looked like a dermoid but then we had to do a muscle biopsy because it was involving specifically the the muscle itself there it was a confusion between a dermoid or a lipoma but dermoid was the one that was more uh, we were thinking in terms of uh on table it looked like a dermoid so there was an attempt was made to excise the mass yeah it would be uh, an incision biopsy because obviously the muscle would not be excised as a whole so the take home message you wanted to give is that initially we should go for some medicinal treatment and then if it doesn't works out do a muscle biopsy uh like we should be a little um we should have an index of suspicion in cases where we, we cannot just blindly treat all cases thinking it's an iod with steroids because a lot of uh, some atypical presentations like uh we always think of ted and iod so we should just keep in mind that if it's just like uh a painless presentation like involving uh, a unilateral muscles muscles which are not commonly involved in ted or iod maybe we should think of other diagnosis so, but uh, most of the cases we got were treated with steroids elsewhere and then they had come to us so it's just something that we could do which could hasten the treatment did you find cases of muscle weakness post op we didn't have but uh, there were reports have been there but we didn't have any such not diplopia post op diplopia or anything not a single case we didn't have okay thank you prithvi yeah. thank you uh, this next speaker is dr shubha jawar present noon everyone so at the outset i thank the association maharashtra association as well as the all india society for giving me this opportunity to present how we tamed the ferocious mucormycosis wave so second wave of the dreadful covid-19 wave march 2021 we started getting patients of orbital cellulitis in covid affected patients and by second week of may we had uh, begun to see crops of these patients and as i intimated my dean she took cognizance and gave me the gigantic responsibility of being nodal officer mucormycosis and from there on started the massive job so rocm as you know is a dreadful life threatening disease seen in immunocompromised post covid patients the disease starts in the nose uh, engulfs the orbit and then reaches the brain so the plan of action that we followed was we uh, organized and attended various webinars wherein discussions were held with national oculoplasty surgeons like dr santosh honavar dr ramesh murthy and likewise also discussions with departments of ent medicine and micro a committee was formed for the institution and sop was formulated a separate ward for mucormycosis was designated drugs were procured and management was planned 
so life saving measures that we took prevention uh, was employed by increasing the awareness about the science in post covid patients early diagnosis and high clinical suspicion was the goal and early intervention was done to save life to save eyeball and to save the vision so this is how the patients presented with uh, tense periobital edema proptosis chemosis extraocular movements fixed and some scar around the eye so th uh, the same patient mri showed uh, uh, pan uh, sinusitis here as well as the orbit was involved or vital apex was involved and extension into the cavernous sinus so treatment was of course a team approach wherein the medicine people uh, went ahead with the glycemic control and reversal of immune status systemic antifungals like iv um, liposomal amphotericin b was started and also syrup posaconazole surgical treatment plan was functional endoscopic sinus surgery where radical debridement of multiple sinuses was done and debridement of medial peri orbita were required irrigation with local antifungals tram injections and excentration so this was a schematic diagram that i chalked out for my residents to follow wherein you can see uh, in the first two where there was just a periobital edema and no other signs we could uh, we went in for fest surgery while as where uh, a proptosis was there chemosis was there extraocular movements were restricted but the vision was not affected there we went in with uh, uh, tram injections and wherever there was chemosis proptosis scar and where the vision was no pl we went in for excentrations so local amphotericin b was effective because uh, uh, it was a vaso occlusive disease and caused a necrosis inviting the fungus and here in this dead uh, devitalized tissue the systemic antifungals won't reach so tram was effective as an adjunct therapeutic option for this where in early orbital presentation uh, and where vision was uh, present so there we used tram but it could not replace excentration because this was a life saving procedure so liposomal amphotericin b in <coughs> sorry in the dose of 3.5 mg per ml was given od this was how the injection was given and uh, um, so in such cases where a uh, lot of uh, uh, findings were not there we went in with fest uh, surgery and here where some restriction of lateral movement was there then tram was given with a good result here again uh, uh, with extraocular uh, muscle uh, Uh, movements were there vision was there so we went in with tram injections and here extraocular movements were all restricted and you could see the post uh, tram uh, picture which was uh, which gave a, a good result here again the post tram picture you can see and uh, for this young fellow also where prominent fat stranding were seen on mri we gave in tram injections so tram was an advantageous simple bedside procedure uh, it minimized the fungal load and reduce the progression of orbital infection and visual acuity was restored so this in conjunction with iv antifungals and fes salvaged the globe and vision of the patient so this was how fes was done in fear of orbital debridement in certain cases excentration was done to prevent further spread into the intracranial extension and save the life of the patient it was done in non -P uh, no pl eyes and where orbital apex and diffuse involvement was there and cavernous sinus was involved so in such case cases where scar was there and proptosis we we did with lid sparing um excentration so this was how excentration was done and in few cases so this was the data the monthly data right from june to february 222 where you can see 353 cases were treated wherein we did excentration in only 9 cases and 53 cases we gave tram so uh this was the surgical data where fes and tram was given in 53 and excentrations done only in 9 cases so these were the results the treatment was challenging so life saved 83.29% eyes saved 96% and excentration only in 2.54 that is 9 cases so in conclusion i should say early intervention proper charting of management multidisciplinary approach uh tram and uh, uh, also iv amphotericin b all these helped us tide over the ferocious mucormycosis wave successfully these are the references thank you so much can i ask a question yes please. see what was the dose of tram like did you give it once daily or twice daily uh once daily and alternate day three injections that was what we followed three days a week 
pardon? Alternate days. Yeah. Alternate day, yeah. So three days a week. Uh, yeah, maybe three days a week. Yes. So if uh, the patient was responding, only three patient, uh, three injections uh, would suffice, or else we would increase it to five injections. And after reconstituting, would you finish it off, or would you reserve it in the fridge? We the would injection. finish it off the injection. Yeah. We'll finish it off. Yes. Yes, yes, most of the patients. No, they were given uh, IV liposomal uh, amphotericin B with that. <coughs> if the disease progressed, yeah, then we went ahead with excentration. So, depending upon the radiological findings. Till five injections we were giving, yeah. If not responding or if uh, it was not ha halted and it was progressing, then we had to go for uh, further. Uh, yeah. So in some a few cases we did inferior orbital debridement only or uh, face with medial periorbital uh, debridement. Yeah, in a single patient we encountered a uh, post uh, injection inflammation. No, ma'am. No. And was the cause of death analyzed to be mucomarcosis? Yeah, death cases, cause or? of the maximum patients' uh, death here occurred before we could understand what is happening. So, in the first uh, ten days of May, like uh, like we were not uh, even able to realize what is happening. They were coming with severe proptosis and uh, scar, a big scar. In those cases, then we could not save those cases and. Uh, they used to die they were uh, patients who were positive and already in ICU so still positive so before we could do anything for them they would die no um, my question is those who die yes we analyze that that cause of death is mucormycosis or something else uh, another no. uh, uh, what we thought of was it this is not studied and still not studied was uh, maybe an involvement of pulmonary mucormycosis also uh, happening into these patients and maybe that was the reason why they died because a lot of cardio cardiomyopathies were the cause of yes cardiomyopathy and another cause yeah because this is a vessel occlusive disease finally but this with the uh, scar and uh, prominent mucormycosis of course that was the cause Yeah, 50, 53 cases, uh, average three, 3 was effective, yeah. So within a week, we could get uh, good results. Mean was 3, sir, 3 injections, yes. In very few cases, we had to go for 5. Okay, ma'am. Thank you for Thank your presentation. You, Thank you very much. PMMA as an orbital implant in enucleation and evisceration. So, following evisceration and enucleation, an orbital implant is used to replace lost orbital volume, maintain the structure of the orbit, and impart motility to the underlying ocular processes for optimal result. The PMMA is a non-integrated, non-porous solid implant which is cost-effective alternative to various porous orbital implants mostly used in the western countries. Limited studies have uh, used sclera as a wrapping material for PMMA implant in enucleation with varied outcomes. So no Indian study has uh, reviewed the outcomes of PMMA orbital implant both evisceration and enucleation which uh, had the donor sclera wrap technique and there is a paucity of literature on the outcomes of PMMA implant with donor sclera wrap technique in enucleation with regards to the motility and the complications. So our aim was to study the clinical outcomes of primary PMMA orbital implant patient following evisceration and enucleation at a tertiary care center in central India. The primary objective was to evaluate the implant movement, implant re retention and implant migration if any after enucleation evisceration with primary orbital PMMA implantation and secondary objective was to study the uh, implant related complication like implant exposure, implant extrusion, conjunctival deviations and superior sulcus deformity in patients after enucleation and evisceration. So, study area was the Oculoplastic Service MGMI Institute of Raipur Chhattisgarh with it was a prospective interventional case series of 12 months duration and 45 eyes of 45 patients were included. Inclusion criteria in, uh, were the painful blind eye, infective or non-infective 
and intraocular malignancies like retinoblastoma, uval melanoma is included. Severe ocular trauma with non-salvageable globe, physis bulbi, atrophic bulbi, and panophthalmitis. Exclusion were post-traumatic severely contracted socket, post-irradiation contracted sockets, and patient with retinoblastoma who were due to EVRT or congenital anophthalmia with contracted socket. So, methodology included the demography and detailed history of the patient, comprehensive examination, specific examination which was required for the particular case, relevant uh, investigations and the type of surgery, surgical technique, follow-ups and rehabil uh, rehabilitation with prosthesis was noted. So, the implant size uh, was according to the axial length of the normal eye and the sclera used as a repairing material that was 1.5 millimeters. Formula used was uh, the implant diameter axial length minus 5.5 millimeter. Final decision on the size of the orbital implant to be used was based on the clinical and intraoperative findings of the patient's orbital and ocular anatomy and this space. So, follow-up then first post-operative day, first four to six weeks post-operatively and the 48 weeks. Custom ocular prosthesis was fitted on the sixth week post-op uh, follow-up. On the follow-up period for uh, custom ocular prosthesis, parameters like implant motility, orbital volume displacement, the minor complication, major complication were assessed, documented and analyzed. So, descriptive statistics were used for this study. So, these are the uh, uh, surgical procedure which were done. This is the evaluation with uh, PMMA implant placed in the skeletal pocket and it was uh, sutured with vical suture and the standard procedure. Then the enucleation was done. This is uh, important. So here in the enucleation, the wrapping material used was the sclera along with the PMM implant wrapped in it and four rectile muscle was sutured to the four quadrants and then it was closed. So, following the post-operative period, we see the implant motility here with the scleral wrapped orbital implant as compared to the normal eye and following the uh, addition of the prosthesis gives very good cosmesis along with the motility. So, mean age of presentation was 41 years, mean axial length was around 22.43, mean size of the PMM orbital implant was around 16 millimeter. Horizontal excursion was around 7 mm, vertical excursion was around 8.9 mm and the mid motility index was around 4 mm. So most di common diagnosis was the perforated corneal ulcer followed by the uh, uh, staphyloma and the thysis bulbi. The presentation is mostly acquired condition were more compared to the congenital and surgery performed were mostly the evisceration uh, two third and enucleation one third. The orbital volume replacement was uh, good in 78% uh, of the cases and orbital implant was written in 98% of cases. Major complications uh, were around uh, only 7% implant extrusion and exposure and minor complication was around uh, conjectival deviations, which was around 7%. So these are the literature search which I have done. Orbital implant size average size was around 16 mm in our uh, study which is equivalent and orbital implant outcome was better in our uh, cases like exposure was 2 and 5 percent and implant retention was also better 90 percent and the excursion was also comparable. So the PMMA orbital implant following evisceration and inoculation with the scleral wrap is a good cost effective option which provide adequate volume replacement along with a good anatomical and functional outcome in relation to the implant and prosthesis movement with minimal complications. Thank you. These are my references. Yes, in the enucleated eye, we used a scleral wrap. So, what it uh, adds on is that one is the availability, we have the availability of donor sclera and advantage of that is that the extrusion and the exposure is very less in this and in my technique what I have done is once the donor sclera is taken, I have put the implant inside and then I re reverse it out like the open will be open and will be towards the inside of the tenon space and the external part which you see in the center. I take the optic nerve stump as the uh, central point. So that is a advantage for me to attaching the muscles. This will be the central point and four muscles are attached in four quadrants. So in that way I have uh, excluded that there will be no exposure or uh, 
uh, extrusion of the implants and thereby even the motility is good because I am attaching to the sclera at the point of insertion which is normally in the sclera. So there are two parts of it. One is the complication part and second is the motility part. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, yes. We have, we have. Numbers were not same, but we have compared, and it was comparable. That was one of the significant finding what I've seen. I attach it directly on the sclera. Donor sclera. Donor sclera. Slide make a fibrosis so that it attaches. But from my experience, I have got very good results. And the motility part is very good. And patients are very satisfied with that. Judges. <laughs> Yes. Five point five. Yeah, because sclera is a component. Sclera is around one point five, and the prosthesis is taken around four millimeter, the thickness. So I deduct it from that. So it's coming to five point five. So. And moreover, smaller size. But previously we had like uh, putting a very big. Uh, implant size but over the period of time we saw that there are a lot of uh, complication were associated with it so nowadays we are coming to an optimal size which can have a better motility and also cosmesis with long term uh, no complication effects so i believe in my patients uh, i get a very good volume replacement along with a good motility and cosmesis Huh. evisceration mostly it was like if it's a very big anterior staphyloma if it's a thysis bulbi or with intraocular tumor suspect then those cases I had taken for enucleation so most of the patients were evisceration because nowadays it is just shifting uh, terms towards the evisceration if uh, the globe is intact not suspecting an uh, intraocular malignancy Yes, yes, yes. Yes. No. The reason is that the wrapping uh, technique which I am using. So. Yes, yes. Uh, there, here there, uh, there is some modification like the size of the implant and then the size of the or thickness of the prosthesis. So these two uh, we balance it and accordingly the cosmesis is slightly better as compared. So, I just wanted to say that it's nice that you can collect the whole eyeball because usually people don't agree to it. Yes. Sclera even if it, it is used for scleral grafts and other patch grafts, so sclera is available of course. Like. No. Ha. Corneal button. Corneal buttons. Yes, yes. They are supplying actually. What we are doing is we are getting the canal button only. But uh, when we get the supply, it's from sclera. It's our, I get from Arvind basically. Right sir, thank you.